few brethren and sisters gathered here this afternoon. And there was a gentleman who lived in my uh, in my little neighborhood when I was growing up, and he was not truly a blood relative, but he was such a close friend of the family that we all know him affectionately as Uncle Patrick. And Uncle Patrick was kind of my contact with personal reality when I was undergoing the collegiate experience. He was the one who always had Thanksgiving dinner with us. We'd come home from college, Thanksgiving evening, I'd walk through the front door in the living room, and there to greet me would be my Uncle Patrick, a big plug of tobacco in his right jaw, Maxwell House coffee can in his left hand. Hi, son, nice to see you. How's things going off there at the university? That's good. Well, now I know you're preparing yourself to become a viable member of society, but you know, when you leave them hallowed halls and step out here into the real world, you won't encounter something I think you need to be warned about. <laughs> it's called work. <laughs> yeah, I've seen pictures of it. It ain't pretty. And he would, he would proceed to tell me that no matter how much I came to love my chosen profession, that there'd be an occasional morning when I, I'd hear that alarm clock go off, I'd bolt up in bed, and the single most articulate sound I'd be able to mutter would be something like, no. He said, son, when this happens more than anything in all the world, what you need is an excuse to give your boss to explain why you ain't going to be at work. He says, I got one for you here, which was given to me by my granddaddy who come over here from the land of Ireland. He recommended you send these excuses in the form of a card or a letter as follows. Dear boss, I write this note to you to tell you of my plight. And at the time of writing, I am not a pretty sight. My body is all black and blue, my face a deadly gray. And I hope you'll understand why Patty's not at work today. I was working on the 14th floor, some bricks I had to clear. And throwing them down from such a height was not a good idea. The foreman wasn't pleasant, he being an awful thought. And he said I'd have to take them down the ladder in my heart. Well, clearing all these bricks by hand, it was so awful slow. So I hoisted up a barrel and secured a rope below. But in my haste to do the job, I was too blind to see that a barrel full of building bricks was heavier than me. So I went down to cut the rope, and the barrel fell like lead. And clinging tightly to the rope, I started up instead. I shot up like a rocket, and to my surprise, I found that halfway up, I met the bloody barrel coming down. The barrel struck my shoulders to the ground it sped, and when I reached the top I hit the pulley with my head. I spun around all stunned and shocked from this almighty blow, while the barrel spilled out half the bricks fourteen floors below. Now when these bricks had fallen from the barrel to the floor, I then outweighed the barrel and I started down once more. Still clinging tightly to the rope, I headed toward the ground, and fell upon the building bricks that were all scattered round. Now as soon as I had hit the ground, I thought I'd pass the worst. When the barrel hit the pulley and then the bottom burst, a shower of bricks fell down on me, I hadn't got a hope. And as I was losing consciousness, I let go the bloody rope. Well, the barrel now being heavier, it started down once more. Struck across me smartly as I lie there on the floor. It broke some ribs in my left arm, and I can only say, I hope you'll understand why Patty's not at work today.